coming to ct pulmonary angiogram as we have seen this is totally becoming and replacing conventional pulmonary angiogram to become a gold standard in investigation in uh, pulmonary embolism and to rule out a role in pulmonary embolism and it is uh, it is now available most of the times the ct scans are available everywhere so it is readily available and it has a high positive predictive value so again here depend here here comes the role of calculating those geneva or uh, well score or the prediction probably pre test prediction so if the patient is having high pre test probability of pulmonary embolism and ct pulmonary em uh, angiogram says that the patient is having pulmonary angiogram then we can be reasonably reasonably sure that the patient is having pulmonary angiogram uh, pulmonary em embolism but if the patient is having low probability of having pulmonary embolism and we still undergo ct pulmonary angiogram and it is showing that the patient is having some subsegmental or segmental thrombosis then the diagnosis remains controversial okay and uh, the other way around if the patient is having high pro pre test probability of having pulmonary em uh, uh, embolism a ctpa doesn't really reveal anything so ctpa there is nothing but the ct the ct pulmonary angiogram uh, the the pre test probability is high now what to do now you can there is it is controversial but you can still go for further tests like vq scan you can go for compression ultrasound you can go for 2d echo and see for rb dysfunction to see if the patient is having pulmonary embolism to to decide about the therapy okay so this is ct pulmonary angiogram this is a saddle thrombus which is uh, on the first picture there is a th saddle thrombus which is uh, in the main pulmonary trunk and uh, this the, this again picture is showing a saddle thrombus and this is a segmental thrombus into the right uh, pulmonary artery and this is a sub segmental thrombus so incidental sub segmental thrombus doesn't uh, warrant uh, uh, anticoagulation most of the times but the patient is having a cancer or high risk then we may consider on case to case basis so ct pulmonary angiogram uh, is done in most of the intermediate and high risk patients with pulmonary angiogram so again the, stressing upon this was a study uh, which was done by a pyopad invest two investigators they saw that if the positive predictive value of ct pulmonary angiogram is high if the patient is having high clinical probability but if the patient is having low clinical probability the positive predictive value of the ct pulmonary angiogram is only 58% so even if the ct pulmonary angiogram says that this is a pulmonary embolism you cannot be very sure that this is actually pulmonary embolism okay <clears throat> then vq scan so when when are vq scans done vq scans are generally done when the ct pulmonary angiogram is not available or is contraindicated what are the what is the problem so especially in intensive care unit vq scan asks us that the chest x ray should be normal which is not the case in most of the patients in intensive care unit uh, other other scenarios where vq scan is done when the probability is low and it is a young female because the breast, the the radiation to the breast tissue in a ct pulmonary angiogram is high and there is a dye if if the, there is a dye involved so if the patient is pregnant then again a ct pulmonary angiogram is relatively avoided it is not contraindicated but avoided and if the patient is having anaphylaxis or uh, allergy to the city uh, to the dye or to the dye although most of the dyes are non anionic nowadays so allergy is rare and if the patient is having severe renal failure again city pulmonary angiogram is contraindicated so if you have vq scan with you you can go for it so xenon gas and krypton gas is uh, given in the ventilation so what what is done it is first the ventilation scan is done then the perfusion scan is done so we need to see if the there is a ventilation perfusion mismatch so ventilation scan is done with xenon 133 and krypton 81 gas and the perfusion scan is one done with technetium 99 labeled aerosols or albumin or carbon microparticles and uh, so again the vq scan will give you uh, <clears throat> three things that is a normal scan high probability scan or non diagnostic scan so normal scan will exclude pe because if the this of perfusion is normal then obviously the uh, pulmonary embolism is reasonably ruled out it is highly unlikely that the patient is having pulmonary embolism but if the perfusion scan is showing defects and ventilation scan is also if the ventilation scan is also showing defects and the then then, then there is a controversy then it becomes a non diagnostic scan so which is around 40 to 50% of the cases times we get a vq scan report with a non diagnostic scan that's how it is the limited the, the 
the limitation is there so this is how it is done if the pre pre test probability is uh, low then we don't need to do anything if the pre test probability is intermediate or high we see if the baseline image is normal the x ray is normal we do a perfusion scan if there is everything is normal in perfusion scan we don't do anything if the perfusion scan is showing defects only then we do a ventilation scan and it will uh, uh, see if uh, tell us if there is a uh, corresponding defect or not okay so mr ngo has been tried it is very good in uh, diagnosing central thrombosis but it doesn't give us other uh, causes doesn't rule out other causes and it is long it is time taking costly and uh, it, uh, the uh, the distal thrombosis are missed very frequently so not recommended as of now so this is basically what we have what we have discussed ct pulmonary angiogram is uh, the gold most uh, is nowadays a gold standard uh, although pulmonary angiogram is there but it is invasive and it gives a lot of radiation around 10 to 20 uh, millisieverts so it is generally avoided and uh, to overcome the deficiencies of vq scan, planar vq scan vq spec scan has been proposed but uh, still there is not enough data to recommend vq spec scan and coming to echocardiography what to what we see in echocardiography so there is rv dysfunction obviously echo will show us something so what will what it will show us it will it will show us that the rv is not contacting properly so there are some uh, there are some uh, <coughs> signs which have been become specific to uh, uh, pulmonary embolism one is mcconnell sign what happens is there is depressed contractility of rv free wall the right ventricular free wall doesn't move much but the right ventricular apex moves very well so that is how mcconnell sign is defined and if it is found then we can be we can be very suspicious that the patient may be having pulmonary embolism second is 60 60 sign what is what does it mean it means that the pulmonary ejection acceleration time uh, it will be difficult for the people who are not into echo so it, the pulmonary ejection acceleration time is less than 60 seconds along with peak systolic tricuspid valve gradient is less than 60 millimeter of mercury the 6060 sign is this is what is called 6060 sign the 6060 sign is also very specific for pulmonary embolism besides that the tricuspid, tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion commonly known as TAPSE. the TAPSE is tricuspid the tricuspid valve annular plane systolic excursions so they are decreased so if it is less than 15 millimeter of uh, millimeter then the, the this indicates that there is rv dysfunction so this is also found in echocardiogram and besides that the more important is that echocardiogram doesn't rule out pulmonary embolism first thing is that but it in a hemodynamically unstable patient if there is no rv dysfunction so this is very important in a hemodynamically unstable patient if there is no rv dysfunction it almost excludes that this patient is not hemodynamically unstable because of pulmonary embolism so because if the patient has become hemodynamically unstable there has to be a rv dysfunction because we have seen the pathophysiology for that patient to become hypotensive so that we should look at other causes of hypertension besides that echo also gives us other causes like if the patient is having pericardial if the pericardial if you not tamponade as the patient is having myocardial infarction those things we can see from echocardiography and second thing is absence of rv overload or dysfunction in a high risk pe so similarly if the patient is having high risk pulmonary embolism but there is absence of echocardiographic signs of rv dysfunction so hemodynamic instability has not been caused by rv uh, by pulmonary embolism so this we need to see majorly uh, next Sides are not moving. Um, doctor, it has changed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, now it has changed. Yeah. So, uh, this, this is a diagrammatic picturesque representation. Uh, in the plaques view, parasternal long axis view, we can see RV enlarged right ventricle. In the four chamber view, we can see McConnell sign. In the uh, parasternal short axis view, we can see D sign or RV dilation. So RV size will be equal to or greater than LV. Generally, RV is less than the size of RV is less than LV. But if this RV size is more than LV, then we can say that uh, this could be because of pulmonary embolism. The dilatation of inferior vena cava because of the back pressures. 
and we can sometimes find a clot inside the, uh, the uh, our right ventricular and right atrium and this is 60 60 sign and taps it you need to see so this is uh, which, uh, this is an echocardiogram. This is an echocardiogram which shows that there is a thrombus, there is a mobile thrombus in the right ventricle and right atrium. So it is moving from right ventricle to right atrium. So this is diagnostic of pulmonary embolism, and we can straight away thrombolyze the patient. No need to get a CT pulmonary angiogram in such a patient if the patient is see, hemodynamically unstable. Okay. So this is uh, McConnell sign. So you can see the RV free wall is not moving but the rv apex is contracting well so this is specific for pulmonary embolism and secondly you will see d sign so this is d sign this is basically right ventricle this is left ventricle you can see the lv is not getting filled properly and the rv right ventricle is dilated and it is pushing on the left ventricle so this is the rv the interventricular septal is getting flattened This is how we measure TAPSE. So we put a M mode on the little free wall of the right ventricle. At the level of annulus, we put a M mode and we see the excursion of uh, this uh, annulus uh, in the M mode. So if the excursions are less than 15 millimeter, it indicates RV dysfunction. It doesn't indicate exactly that it is pulmonary embolism, but it indicates that it is RV dysfunction. So recommendations, we have discussed most of them. Coming to uh, that the patient has now been diagnosed with pulmonary embolism. Now again, the question comes, which patient we should be discharging home, which patient we should be admitting, and which patient we should be keeping in hospital, in ICU, and which patient we should be thrombolyzing. Again, uh, this was earlier very empirical. It was clinician-based practice, which was not getting, which was getting wavered because people were using echocardiographic signs of RV dysfunction, CT pulmonary angio, they used to see if there is uh, RV dilatation, of, if there is uh, basically uh, a thrombus in the right ventricle or in the pulmonary, main pulmonary artery, or if the patients are having hypotension, tachycardia, respiratory insufficiency, syncope. So these things people used to manage, matter. But now, uh, 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 now what they have done is they have, they have formulated a criteria. This is pulmonary embolism, that the pulmonary embolism severity index. So based on that, uh, now the European Society of Cardiology recommends us to see, to check the 30-day mortality, the 30-day mortality risk of the patient. So based on that, the patient is categorized as high, intermediate, or uh, low risk in of having a 30-day mortality. So we'll discuss that. Uh, what are the biomarkers which we sh should use in which you use in uh, ca cases of diagnosing and checking the severity of pulmonary embolism? So this comes mostly most of the times in severity severity assessment. So when the common is uh, markers of myocardial injury like troponins and markers of RV dysfunction that is anti pro BNP. Besides these markers, these are commonly sent. And if the anti pro BNP and troponin is high, the patient is considered as a, a high risk. That is intermediate high risk. If the patient is having hypotension, then it is considered high risk of mortality. If the patient is having RV dysfunction with high uh, troponins and or you know, anti-pro BNP, then the patient is considered as intermediate high risk. So intermediate risk is also again divided into high and low. So it is high risk, intermediate high, intermediate low, and low risk. So what are the laboratory biomarkers? They are lactate levels. Other laboratory biomarkers, they are lactate levels, creatinine levels, Hyponatremia has surprisingly been shown as prediction of uh, in hospital mortality. I think this is a general uh, prediction, not specific to pulmonary embolism. And the uh, vasopressin analog, copeptin, the vasopressin surrogate, copeptin, this has also been used. So what is high-risk pulmonary embolism? So the high-risk pulmonary embolism means the patient is having more than 10% risk or 12, 13% risk of having mortality, 13, uh, of, having, of dying in 30 days. So if the patient is having hemodynamic instability, it directly goes into high-risk pulmonary embolism. So how to uh, quantify hemodynamic and, uh, 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 instability? One thing is if the patient is in cardiac arrest. Obviously, the patient is uh, hemodynamically unstable. Second, if the patient is in obstructive shock. So how you define obstructive shock in relation to pulmonary embolism, high-risk pulmonary embolism? If the systolic blood pressure is 90 millimeter from mercury or 
the vasopressors are required to maintain systolic blood pressure above 90 millimeter of mercury and there is end organ hypoperfusion and if end organ hypoperfusion is not there then if the systolic blood pressure remains below 90 millimeter of mercury for more than 50 minutes or blood pressure drops from baseline to more than 40 millimeter of mercury for more than 50 minutes then there is this is this is classified as acute high risk pulmonary embolism <laughs>